You have to just keep trying. If you want it bad enough, you just got to keep working on it. Hey everybody, it's Jim and Joe again from Moyer Made. It's the 15 year anniversary of putting out the original video on the world's smallest Chevrolet V8 that thanks to all you guys out there gave us over 6 million views on. So we thought we'd memorialize the occasion. We would uh, answer some questions and go into more details about the, uh, the V8 here. Why don't we start off with talking about what the Chevy V8 is and, um, you know, like the dimensions, uh, what's it a model of? Well, um, it's a scale model of a 1964 Corvette 365 horse, 327. And it's one sixth scale. So basically I just measured full size parts and divided it by six. And that's what I've come up with for, um, for the dimensions of it. It has a few castings. The valve covers are um, investment cast. As you can see, it has a Corvette script in it. So let's get into kind of some dimensions here. What, how, about how big is this engine? Well, the block is just a little over three inches long, and that's probably the main dimension of the engine. Mm. What size are the pistons? What diameter are the pistons? The bore is uh, 600 thousandths, and the stroke is uh, 487 thousandths. So 600 thousandths, just over a half an inch. Yeah, just over a half inch, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's a... Oh, yeah, there we go. So if we put, yeah, put that in your hand for... Yeah, you can see the size of that piston there. Everything on that piston is what you might find in, a, in an actual engine then. I think this piston only has an oil ring on it right now, but there's a couple of compression rings over here so you can see, you can see the rings that were on it. Mm -hmm. The grooves are on it. The wrist pin is in it. This is what a rod, the rod bearing looks like in it. Um, you can see that it's scaled down from a full size Chevrolet bearing, and that um, that's kind of a whole another story. <laughs> how I, how I did that, but yeah. anyway, I did it. Okay. And so that's what it has for rod bearings is a little insert bearing like that, mm -hmm. and main bearings also. So, is it a is it a two stroke or a four stroke? Well, it's four stroke. Yeah. And what what's the difference between a two stroke and a four stroke? Well, <clears throat> um, a four stroke fires every other revolution and a two-stroke fires every revolution, okay. every time it turns over. So that's the basic difference. So how did you make that? Tell us a little bit about the process of what it took to build this engine. Well, first of all, I had to come up with material. Um, I had to come up with a piece of aluminum big enough to make the block out of. Um, and then I had to come up with material for the heads and you can see they're, they're not very big, so it didn't take a whole lot of material to do that. And then I have full-size Chevrolet engine parts, so the next thing was to measure off of the full-size parts and then scale it down, mm. divide it by six. And that's how I came up with the dimensions to make everything. Um, other than that, it's just one step at a time. Um, using a milling machine, um, a Dremel grinder. I wore out one Dremel grinder just just carving on that thing to make it look just like a real motor. All of the the curves and, and dimensions and everything just like a real engine. So um, that's, what, that's the tooling that it took to make it. Yeah, about how long did it take? Well, <clears throat> altogether, I worked on it for seven years, but of course, that was not full-time work. Mm. That was only when I had some spare time. So, from beginning to end, it took seven years to build it. If you had, if say you're working on it continuously, then how long did you think it might take? If that was your full-time job? Well, I could make one in a year, probably, but um, that would be. At this point, that would be starting with 
all of the tooling that mm -hmm. I made just to make this engine, which that's a whole nother story too about right. about the the tooling that was made just so I could do the machine work on this engine. So how fast does it go? <laughs> well, I don't know for sure. We figured it would turn 10,000 RPM pretty easy. So it's kind of hard to guess because of, partly because of the sound, you know, on a full size engine, you might mm. be able to guess a little bit, but, but who knows what an engine this size sounds like when it's turning 10,000 RPM. So I don't know. Right. So one of the questions we got is why doesn't it sound like a V8? Well, I can't answer that. <laughs> it's little. Um, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't have probably the the rumble, I suppose, and the lope mm -hmm. of a of a V8. But you know, you're you have a bore that's about a half inch, so you can kind of imagine how much air goes into that, you know, into that bore every time around. So you get a real small combustion out of that. I mean, it's really tiny. So I don't know. Um, I mean, we were talking about that the other day uh, off camera about um, about the air and, you know, some of the challenges with air that just because you scale certain dimensions that not necessarily everything scales. Right. Right. So right. explain a little bit more about that. It's a a mathematical formula you could you could divide 327 by 6 and come up with a number but it would be way bigger than this engine mm. of course so you, it would be ridiculous right so then you have to go back and you have to you have to divide <clears throat> the 327 bore 4 inches by 6 and the stroke by 6 and then you can figure the volume of one cylinder and then you multiply that times eight, and that would give you the volume, the swept volume of this of this engine. Gotcha. And so then, and then it, it gives you a little bit of an idea of how much different it sounds, you know, when you only got two cubic inches, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, making that sound rather than 327 cubic inches making that sound. Do you know how much horsepower or torque it produces? No, I have mm -hmm. no idea except that <clears throat> I think for its size, it's fairly powerful because um, like you could take a hold of, of this little drive here or something like that and, uh, and it'll warm your fingers up pretty good if you try to stop it. So um, it makes pretty good power. So what kind of fuel does it use then? Well, I burn Avgas in it, 100 octane Avgas. Mm. And what, what's the benefit of... How is that different than automobile, you know, what we get out of the pump? Well, for one thing, it has no alcohol in it, no ethanol. And uh, for another thing, it is, um, it has a higher octane, 100 octane compared to with, what, 90 or something like that. It's real pure stuff. It's clear. It has no junk in it at all. Um, and it doesn't even have a big smell like gasoline. Mm -hmm. So it's real clean. It leaves no deposits um, in the engine, and uh, it's just a really nice, clean fuel. So I know we've looked a little bit at the ignition system, which is, you know, we got the distributor, got the distributor cap here, and we have wires coming down to the spark plug. Are those real spark plugs or are those glow plugs? No, those are real spark plugs. <clears throat> so what's the difference between a real spark plug and a glow plug like they might use in, say, a model airplane or something like that? Well, one of the differences in this one is you can't buy a glow plug this small. Okay. Um, so you have to make all those yourself. You make those yourself. The other difference is that a glow plug has a little wire, a little curly spring in it that glows when, it, when the current goes through it. But a spark plug just makes one spark when it comes around. There's just one little spark that jumps across that gap. Mm -hmm. So is it, I see a radiator on there. It has, you mentioned a water pump earlier. Yeah. So it's water cooled. You got water going through that. Mm -hmm. Does that really work? Does that oh, yeah. help cool it down? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah you, the heat comes out. You can feel the heat in the radiator after you've run it a little mm -hmm. while. Yeah. 
the radiator is uh, looks kind of weird because it's designed just like the early Corvette radiators that were primarily primarily aluminum, and they were made different than a regular uh, automobile radiator. And so that's what it kind of has the rounded ends on it like mm -hmm. this, and it didn't have they didn't have tanks on them like a regular radiator on a Corvette. They had a a reservoir that sit back up here and the hose went back to this and that that was the reservoir there was no reservoirs on the radiator it was just a cooler that fell let me see any plans to put this in a car you know um i really thought about trying to build a 32 ford frame for it in fact i went online and got the dimensions off of one and i thought it would be neat to build a uh, a 32, like maybe a three-window coupe or a roadster, mm -hmm. and put this engine in it. But um, that takes time, and I have other engines to build. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, is this just a one-off, or are there any? Is there any kit available for this, or this is the only one? Yeah, <clears throat> it's the only one in the world that I know of. How is this different than other miniature engines that are out there? Well, I think the most obvious thing is that this is a scale model. And and I've tried to make everything um, to an exact scale so that you could look at this engine and you would know what a full-size engine looked like dimensionally and everything. Um, there's even the firing order is on the manifold here, but you can't see it. There's the casting number for the block is back here, just like on a, <clears throat> a real small block Chevrolet. And um, it's just a detail. I mean, you can build a little V8 engine this size, and if you didn't worry about detail, you know, you could build it quickly. Mm -hmm. But the detail is what takes the time to do. And I think one thing that's interesting to people is that if you understand anything about uh, and about an, an ignition system, as you know, that it has a spark that has to jump from one point to the other. And if you get those points close together, it'll jump across them. But in this ignition system, you, want, you just want it to go to one of these terminals, one wire at a time. And most people look at this distributor cap and they say, these are too close together that the spark would jump around all over in them. So there's some trickery involved that it's kind of another story and you can't really see it on the inside to make it so that the spark goes where you want it to go every time. So that's kind of a, that's kind of something that I had to work out that um, it would be easy to understand if I told you, but it's kind of a, a bit of a long story, you know. How about any other challenges that you faced? I mean, obviously you had to make a lot of tooling. The tooling were right. the big things, yeah. Like like the oil pan is is tin. It's made out of um, stovepipe metal, stovepipe tin. And uh, I wish I had one to show you. You could see how deep it is. So that has to all be stretched down into a die. To, and it has to be have the right shape and everything. So those kind of things are really difficult to do. Um, I think on that one it took, I think that was the 12th one that I formed in order to get a good one. So things like that, you know, are hard to do. Carburetor, uh, fuel system, uh, you can't use a float because it's too small to float. So you have to have a special fuel system uh, that's called a flow through um, in order to make that run. And of course, the jets are, are really tiny. They're um, almost eight thousandths in diameter, the, the jets in the carburetor. Um, you know, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of little things you have to work out, like, like a rocker arm. You can see that that's a forming. It's made out of sheet metal. It's formed in a die. To get that right and to get it to look right, to get a hole in it, to heat treat the end so that it doesn't wear out and then a, a little ball that goes in there like a small block Chevrolet has. All of that kind of stuff, it just, it takes a lot of trial and error 
Um, you just got to work at it to get it done. So it's it's just it's pretty straightforward, um, but it just takes a lot of time to do it, and a lot of failure that you have to overcome, and then you have to just keep trying. I mean, if you want it bad enough, you just got to keep working on it. So for anybody out there that says, hey, this would be great. I would love to build something like this. What kind of skills do they need? Well, they have to have some machining skills. They have to know how to use a lathe, and they have to use, know how to use a milling machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have to understand some things about heat treating or hardening. Um, they have to... Um, they have to know how to work tin a little bit. They have to have some casting skills for this one. Um, the valve covers are investment casting, so you'd have to understand how to make a, a mold for the waxes, and then you'd have to learn how to, to cast it, which I had to do. In order to, make, in order to do this, I had to learn myself how to, how to do all this. Um, and, and a, unless you were experienced at that, You'd, somehow you'd have to learn it or know somebody that could teach you how to do those kinds of things. Right, so. right. Okay. So for anybody that, it, you know, say they have those skills and, you know, what, what advice would you give them if they wanted to do a project like this? Oh, well, I'd advise them not to. <laughs> <laughs> I would say start out with a single cylinder engine. Yeah. Something really simple, figure out how to make it run. If you could figure out a single cylinder engine that had a similar bore and stroke, if you could make it run, then go ahead and put time into the V8. But to start on a project like this would be really discouraging for you if you hadn't done it before. All right, everybody, that's the story on the world's smallest Chevy V8. If you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the comments and we'll do our best to address any questions that come up. If you like this content, you know, hit that like and subscribe button. We're hoping to have a lot more content coming up and explain about different projects. So let us know in the comments what you'd like to see, what information you'd like to know, and we'll do our best to, to tell you about that. So this is uh, Jim and Joe from the Moyer Made Garage. We'll be talking to you soon. Thanks.